Hey guys, welcome to topic one of chapter 14. In chapter 14, we have three separate topics. Topic one is going to focus on energy generation in the mitochondria. This is going to finish up our talk on the glycolysis and citric acid cycle that we started in chapter 13. And we're going to wrap up that process with the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis in this topic. Topic two focuses on photosynthesis and topic three focuses on the evolution of chloroplasts mitochondria and how this contributes to life on this planet. So make sure that you have a good handle on all three of those. So in this topic we're going to do an overview of chemiosmosis and then we're going to talk through how mitochondria and their how, about mitochondria and how they use oxidative phosphorylation to generate energy for the cell. So we got a lot to talk about. Most of this should be fairly new but we're going to add a new layer of detail to it that um, that you haven't seen before in some of your other classes. Here are our topic objectives for this chap for this topic. Please let me know if you have any questions about these, as always, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in class. And um, just make sure you understand these before our next exam. All right. So before we get too started, uh, too in depth on everything else, let's just review chemiosmosis and what chemiosmosis is. Chemiosmosis is the process of moving these protons across the membrane. And as you can see here, this is a simplified version of the electron transport chain and ATP synthase. What happens is we harness electrons to force protons from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. As you know from our talk about energy this semester, this is not something that they want to do on their own and so they must harness the energy in these high energy electrons to pump that across. Now once they're across that membrane, they don't want to stay there and that's where ATP synthase comes into play. ATP synthase will allow for these protons to cross back across the membrane into the area that they really want to be and using this uh, motion of them, pr uh, the proton motive force moving across the membrane, they're going to generate ATP for the cell. And so this is a very, very simplified version of the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. But I wanted to get us settled on exactly where we're going and what this is going to do. And this entire topic lecture is just going to focus on adding some more layers to this information. This should hopefully be what you got out of your 201 and other um, early biology classes. All right, so let's talk about the mitochondria and oxidative phosphorylation. So for the rest of the topic, we're going to review these different to um, subtopics. We have the structure of the mitochondria, talk a little bit about chapter 13 again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Then we're going to dive into the electron transport chain, look at the ATP synthase uh, enzyme, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the implications of the oxidative phosphorylation in the cell. So here's an electron micrograph of a micro mitochondria. And as you know, these there's a lot of these in the cell. There's not just one, even though that's what we see in all the textbooks, because mitochondria is a plural. Mitochondrion is single, singular. Now this is the powerhouse of the cell, meaning that it generates a majority of the energy for the cell. So it's important that you understand that. And most of you have a pretty good handle on that already. All eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. That means plants have mitochondria as well. Chloroplasts do not take the place of mitochondria in the cell. They have both. Animal cells, however, only have mitochondria. And as we've talked about, they have their own DNA, RNA, and ribosomes. Now they don't have a whole lot, as we've talked about, but they have, um, but they do have their own. Now let's talk about the structure of the mitochondria. As you can see here, it is a fairly circular organelle like we've talked about before. And it has two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Now that outer membrane is just a standard membrane of the, of the organelle, but that inner membrane is what actually gives us a lot of the ability to do the chemiosmosis that we just talked about. Because what it does is it forms this inner membrane space between the two membranes. And you can see that here with all these invaginations occurring. And these invaginations create a lot more surface area in the mitochondria that allows for a whole lot of places for this electron transport chain and the chemiosmosis to be occurring. So that we have a lot of place to make the, um, the ATP. And this inner membrane space is where we're going to pump those protons that we just talked about into. So it's important that you understand how the structure here allows for the rest of the process to occur. So now let's talk about chapter 13. Remember in chapter 13 we talked about the catabolism of food. We talked about the three steps of the catabolism of food. There was the initial macro scale breakdown, then there was glycolysis, and then there was a citric acid cycle.
and in glycolysis in the citric acid cycle, both of these removed high energy electrons from those food molecule molecules and it, they were carried away by high energy electron carriers NADH and FADH2. What these molecules are going to do is when they enter, when they reach the electron transport chain, is they're going to give up their electrons, and if they're carrying protons with them, because they sometimes do, um, they'll give those up as well to the electron transport chain and be recycled back to their original state. Now, these that this recycling is really important because it, without this recycling, the cell could not continue to function in this way. Now the citric acid cycle doesn't have a way of obtaining recycled NADH or FADH2 or NAD plus um, without the electron transport chain and the only way this will happen is through the presence of molecular oxygen and the functioning of the electron transport chain. This is why the citric acid cycle is said to be an aerobic process. Glycolysis on the other hand has that secondary branch of fermentation that will allow for cells to undergo um, to recycle that NADH back to NAD+. So glycolysis is said to be, a, a, to be independent of oxygen requirements. It can either occur in the presence or without the presence. But it's important to realize that it's all because of the recycling of these high energy electron carriers. With the whole goal being to simply siphon off these electrons from food molecules to transport to the electron transport chain. So now let's look at the chemiosmosis in the mitochondria. We just talked about the basic concepts of chemiosmosis where we pump protons across the membrane and they come back through the ATP synthase. Now you can see here a couple of, uh, couple of important points about this. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail now. We have the chemiosmosis occurring in the mitochondria. What we start with is we start with the energy in the form of high energy electrons. This is with NADH carrying those electrons and through this process we're going to transform it through oxidative phosphorylation to energy being stored in high energy phosphate bonds. So you can see how that's being trans uh, how that is transferred here on the left. Now how does this occur? NADH and FADH2 is going to reach the electron transport chain which is for all intents and purposes three main proteins that they're going to drop off the electrons and these electrons are then going to pump protons across the membrane and allow those protons to come back through ATP synthase. As they pass back through they're going to generate ATP through the combining of ADP and PI with the ATP synthase using that uh, proton motive force of the protons coming back across to drive this energy change. So all we're doing is transferring energy from electron form to a phosphate bond and this is just a way of us harnessing all of that energy that was found in the food you ate for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So now let's look a little bit more in depth at the electron transport chain. Um, you'll hear this sometimes called the respiratory chain but the electron transport chain seems to be the most common name for it now. Now we have a couple different main protein complexes with a couple of shuttling complexes in here and I want you to make sure you know what these are. So as you can see here the NADH will enter the process and it will dump its electrons and or if it's got protons with it, protons at the NADH dehydrogenase complex. This is the first proton. What it does is it's going to ha take that electron and it's going to shuttle it around within the protein and there's these metal ions inside that are going to bounce that electron across and it's going to cause the redox reaction to occur. And so by harnessing this redox uh, potential and having it change it's going to siphon off a little bit of that energy. Once it's done bouncing around within this protein it's going to be passed to the ubiquitinone, the molecule that's represented with the Q here. That's going to pat, shuttle the electron over to cytochrome BC1 complex where once again the electrons are going to be shuffled around within the uh, um, protein and have that redox potential taken and have a little bit of that energy released from those electrons. The electrons are then going to be passed to cytochrome C where they will be, then be shuttled to the final proton, protein in the system which is the cytochrome oxidase complex. Now after the electrons are shuffled around inside, inside the cytochrome C complex and have all of the energy removed from them, they will be delivered to the final electron acceptor, which is molecular oxygen, 
when molecular, molecular oxygen meets these electrons and some proton and some new protons, we're going to form water. And this is where that water or that oxygen demand comes from within the cell. So this is um, water is really electronegative as we talked about over and over again and so that's going to that it readily accepts these electrons it's always super happy to take on more electrons now it's estimated that cytochrome oxidase complex this last protein in the electron transport chain utilizes 90 percent of all the oxygen brought into your cells this shows how much of this process is occurring within the body if you think about how much oxygen we bring in as we breathe throughout the day and it's almost all going to this one place within your cells. So make sure you understand this process and how this works and how these electrons are shuttled and how the protons are pumped across them. So we're going to spend a little bit more time looking at that now. Let's look at the proton pumping. So as I said, a lot of times the electrons will enter the complexes at the same time as the hydrogen, as the proton, or the electrons and the protons will enter the complex together. What's going to happen then is the proteins are, under, are going to undergo a conformational shift, which allows for this natural passing through of these protons to the other side of the membrane. And you can see that happening here. So the proton will be brought in once the energy is also the electron energy is put in and it's been um, siphoned off, the protein is going to change conformational shape and that will then release the proton back to the other side of the gradient. Now remember there's this really high uh, proton co concentration on this other side so it's really important that this new conformational change and you can see that here in conformation C has a low affinity for protons so they're not likely to rebind to this and be passed across again through this way. So what will happen is this channel will then or these proteins will then relax back into their original conformation and the original conformation has a high affinity for that proton. And so you can see it's through this shuttling, kind of like that transport mechanism we talked about before, that allows for us to shuttle the protons across the membrane using the energy from the electrons to create the conformational change. All right, so we talked about the electron transport chain. Now let's talk about the ATP synthase. ATP synthase is a very large molecule and it looks like an upside down lollipop and there's a whole lot of different parts to it but what I want you to know is the two main sections. There's the F0 section which is the transmembrane section. It's almost it's the water wheel area at the top that's embedded in the membrane. Then we have the F1 which is the ATPase section. So what's going to happen is the ATP is going to come through the FO the F0 section, it's going to drive the conformational changes in the F1. And now ATP can run in both ways to create ATP or to create ADP and PI depending on what's needed to happen and we'll talk about that in these next couple slides. So let's look here first. Let's talk about what's going to drive this and that's that proton motive force I've been talking about. There are two parts to the proton motive force. There's the voltage and there's the pH. And we've talked about both of these when we talked about ion channels. When we pump a whole bunch of protons across the membrane, this is going to change the, uh, uh, the, um, the charge in there because there's a whole bunch of positively charged molecules on one side and a whole lot of negatively charged molecules on the other side, or uh, not very many negative or positively charged molecules on the other side. We also, because these protons have a charge, are going to create a very, um, a pH gradient as well where you can see that here we have a whole bunch of protons on one side with a pH of 7 and within the matrix the pH is 7.5. This creates another gradient. So between these two gradients this these protons really want to get back across and so they're going to force their little their way through the F0 section to cause the conformational change in the F1 where the cell will harness this, this uh, process to make ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Now this action allow, uh, there it's estimated this action allows for the creation of about 100 ATP molecules per second. This is a very fast action and I've uploaded some videos so you can see exactly what that looks like in uh, Blackboard if you want to see any more on that. So let's look at this a little bit more because as I mentioned ATP can work re in reverse and there are some bacteria who do this if they're going to live in environments that are anaerobic versus aerobic. 
because as we talked about before, it, uh, protons can be used to pump a variety of things across the membrane. So we use this, or bacteria can use this to harness other uh, transporters in order to transport other things across. So it's important to realize that this um, machine can work in two different directions. It can either be used to generate ATP like we talk about within our cells, or in times of low oxygen can be run in reverse to pump protons across the membrane using ATP to do that. So remember is that if we're going to pump the protons back across the membrane using this, it's going to take energy. So let's wrap up this talk by looking at the implications of this whole process. And as you can see here, the table here shows us basically what we think the ATP yield is per molecule of glucose in each of the different steps. Now it's important to realize a few things about this. First of all, this is an estimation. These numbers change fairly regularly, so it's important to realize that these are never hard and fast. The other aspect is, is that it's important to realize that NADH harnessed from glycolysis doesn't have the same energy production as the NADH that's, that's created inside the mitochondria in either the acetyl-CoA transformation or uh, the citric acid cycle. And that's because it requires some energy to transport NADH across the membrane into the ATP, into the mitochondria. And so there's a little bit of energy loss there. So make sure you realize that. And this other image on the slide here just is a really good summary of everything we've been talking about. So it's important that you really have a good handle on this image. This is all how the cell works to create energy and it really works to create about a 10 to 1 ba um, balance of ATP to ADP. So it's really important to understand how this works. And if you ever have a question about how much your cell needs to run, your cells run these processes, all you have to do is try to hold your breath. And as you remember, cytochrome oxidase is used 90% of the oxygen we bring in, so try to hold your breath and see how well your cells do after that. So this is the end of topic one. Please review the objectives and let me know if you have any questions and when you're ready, go on to topic two.